cases, uh, both cases presented as atrial fibrillation, uh, though the approach was similar to SVT, so I have included it in SVT cases. Uh, yeah. So uh, coming to the first case, uh, he's a, he was 40 years old male, uh, extremely symptomatic because of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Uh, Eco-wise, his heart was structurally normal and he had no significant medical history in past. Uh, patient was treated with flecainide, 100 milligram twice a day and 10 milligram of bisoprolol, which uh, didn't really help him. So he was again switched over to amiodarone and metoprolol. Again, that failed. So patient was finally referred for RF ablation to us. Uh, we were fortunate to capture one of his uh, episodes of AFI bond set and uh, this, in this ECG actually uh, the useful information that we could get was uh, the first beat of starting atrial fibrillation episode had positive P wave in lead V1 and positive in lead 2 which was suggestive of somewhere from superior left atrium. Though there is a significant overlap, but uh, it looks like a positive in V1 and positive in V2. There were another episodes uh, in ICU, so we could get 12 lead of the onset of atrial fibrillation. And again, there is significant overlap of T and T waves, but it looks like a positive P wave in lead V1 positive in 2, 3 in AVF, negative in AVR, flat in 1 and AVL. So we thought probably it is a focus in right superior pulmonary vein which is uh, uh, acting as a trigger and inducing this paroxysmal AFib episodes. So we shifted him uh, in lab for uh, ablation of AFib and this is what uh, we have a routine setup for paroxysmal AFib cases. So we use uh, multiple catheters. Uh, decapolar catheter goes from the neck uh, inside the coronary sinus. Another decapolar catheter goes from femoral vein and it uh, uh, from SVC to the crista terminalis area. Uh, quadripolar catheter is in uh, his bundle region with uh, recording good atrial signal which, uh, which actually maps the septal area. And two catheters are uh, positioned in the superior pulmonary vein. One uh, multipolar uh, lasso catheter is usually positioned in the left and mapping is in right. But in this case, we were suspecting that it is probably coming from right superior pulmonary vein. So we position lasso in right and mapping in left uh, superior pulmonary vein. Uh, this is the protocol that we use in all paroxysmal AFib patients who are brought in lab in sinus rhythm. We first do uh, EP study before doing septal puncture. The second step is to give IV isoprenaline infusion uh, and see the activation uh, and trigger for triggers. Uh, step three is burst atrial pacing from 250 to 180 millisecond cycle length or up to atrial ERP. Fourth, we do PVI in any ways, and uh, fifth is after PVI, we repeat isoprenaline and burst atrial pacing. So, EP study was uh, non, and there was no significant uh, findings in EP study, and uh, we started IV isoprenaline infusion. At six mics per minute, uh, patient had a spontaneous onset of AFA. And in EC, 12 lead ECG, the P wave morphology of trigger premature atrial beat was similar to that observed in uh, ICU during spontaneous AVF episode. Here again, there is positive P, uh, positive in 2, 3 AVF. If you look at the intracardiac electrogram, the earliest atrial activity was recorded from the MAP proximal, which, is posi which was positioned in the left superior pulmonary vein. Uh, I, feel, I believe that uh, P wave uh, would be starting much earlier than this, but even if we consider this as a P wave onset, this atrial activity was almost 34 millisecond earlier than the surface P wave. And uh, if you see that, 
the local cycle length in the left superior pulmonary vein was much faster than the atrial activity recorded uh, elsewhere in the right atrium as well as left atrium. What we were suspecting as a trigger in this case, right superior pulmonary vein, uh, if you see the cycle length is similar to the cycle length elsewhere in the atria, which is suggestive that RSPV is only passively activated uh, in this AF episode. So this observation was sufficient to tell us that uh, left the trigger is inside the left superior pulmonary vein and we plan to go ahead with uh, isolation of LSPV first. So we moved our lasso catheter into the LSPV and if you can see that uh, there is a complex fractionated EGMs in the superior pulmonary veins at much high frequency as compared to the rest of the atria. I wonder it can be automaticity or triggered activity induced PAC which uh, leads to local focal re-entrant uh, mechanism which uh, sustains this atrial fibrillation episode in this case. So RF ablation was uh, uh, used CARTO-3 Navistar 7.5 French external irrigated catheter. Uh, it was a non-force uh, sensing catheter. Point by point circumferential PV enteral ablation was planned. 35 watt for anterior and 20 watt for posterior. Uh, application of energy was limited by change in unipolar morphology from biphasic to monophasic R. Uh, many times, uh, if we follow this criteria, uh, even 10 seconds, we can see that uh, this this happening and we can limit the duration of uh, ablation lesion uh, at each side. Or else we give at least 30 seconds of uh, uh, RF lesion. Uh, prolonged duration was required in the ridge area and uh, posterior use was limited by uh, the procedure was done under so, uh, conscious sedation, no GA was used. Uh, we did not monitor any esophageal temperature in this case. So uh, once RF ablation was started, uh, what we could notice that there was uh, multiple episodes where uh, during RF ablation, there was uh, local slowing of the cycle length in left superior pulmonary vein followed by termination. However, I don't think it means anything uh, as far as efficacy of RF ablation is concerned, but what was useful for uh, to us was that in other repeated induction of atrial fibrillation after this episode, these were all were spontaneous induction and every time the trigger was coming from the same area uh, in left superior pulmonary vein. Here it was again 40 millisecond earlier than the surface P wave. This was another episode of termination and reinduction. Here again, uh, activity in LSPV was uh, almost 63 millisecond earlier than the surface P wave. So this led to, uh, you know, uh, we thought that probably we can uh, do just LSPV isolation and just uh, try and induce and see what happens uh, in this case. So this was the uh, final again, it terminated and then it was, there was no spontaneous induction, but if you see the left, entire left pulmonary vein is well connected. So we went ahead with continued RF ablation delivery point by point. And as we uh, progressed our uh, circumferential ablation, and some of the electrograms completely disappeared. There were still uh, some electrograms seen uh, in lasso catheter. Uh, if you see with uh, uh, continued ablation delivery, there was significant delay from the surface P wave to local electrogram uh, timing in left superior pulmonary vein, which is suggestive of gradual development of the conduction delay inside the pulmonary vein. Once we finished with our line, we had a completely silent pulmonary vein uh, with and this remained so uh, for next 45 minutes. LPV remained isolated at 45 minutes. Uh, we tried to induce AF with maximum tolerated dose of isoprenaline. There was no induction of AF with burst atrial pacing. No further ablation was done in this case and no procedural complications were observed. And then some uh, isolated pulmonary vein electrograms were seen which, uh, which was suggestive of entry as well as exit block. 
patient was discharged with uh, tablet uh, bisoprolol 5 mg and xeral uh, uh, to 20 mg once a day. Uh, these medicines were withdrawn after three months of follow up and patient uh, till now has no recurrence of atrial fibrillation in for last 20 months of follow up. So in summary, uh, goal of RA fibrillation for paroxysmal AF uh, uh, is essentially elimination of triggers with least amount of fibrillation possible. Uh, incremental value of other lesion sets like linear ablation lesion, calf ablation, ganglionated plexi ablation, uh, after trigger ablation, uh, elimination has remained unclear and unproven. In this case, LSPV was uh, the trigger as well as driver of atrial fibrillation as evidenced by effect of RA fibrillation. I wonder if I can tell it as a focal AFib. Uh, however, focal AFib should not result into focal ablation, which was done previously, because now we know that uh, it can lead to pulmonary vein stenosis. So at least inside the pulmonary vein, uh, it, it should be followed by circumferential isolation of pulmonary vein. And uh, you can get good long-term result like SVT in such kind of AF cases. And that was one of the reasons why I included it uh, in a SVT talk. Uh, maybe I think we should uh, break here and uh, have a Thank little you. discussion and then move okay. on to the second. Okay, yeah, I think that sounds uh, perfect, Ashish. Right. Um, Neeraj, I might have missed at the, the very beginning. How old was this patient? He's uh, 40 years. 40 years. Young 40 man. Years. Young I mean, excellent. So there, there, there are several points that actually fit the profile of a... I'm sorry, I think there is some noise on my side. Uh, so this... This profile definitely fits of that of uh, what you what you see in some of the respiroaphasic or um, gastroesophageal mortality induced uh, or, or, or gastroesophageal spastic atrial tachycardias that are typically um, originating from the pulmonary veins. So, did this patient have any kind of respiroaphasic uh, initiation of atrial tachycardias? Uh, so never, uh, I never could record any uh, atrial tachycardia episode. All there was a single beat, and it will lead to episodes of uh, AF only. So there was no organized uh, P wave activity in any of his ECG, and also there was I I don't remember was that there was any correlation between uh, meal or anything. Right. Neeraj, I have this thing for you. Uh, you showed uh, during ablation many times uh, there was a termination and reinitiation of the tachycardia. And uh, you did a circumferential isolation of the left superior pulmonary vein. Now, yes. why do you think that the tachycardia terminates and restarts? Is it spontaneous or has it anything to do with the site where you ablate at that point in time? I feel it is spontaneous because... Uh, uh, even in ICU, patient had burst of atrial fibrillation, which will last for maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and spontaneously terminate. Uh, if uh, this termination would have happened with uh, PV isolation, I would have thought that probably it is a result of that. But uh, in this case, uh, I don't feel that it was, uh, it was because of uh, ablation. Uh, but yes, uh, spontaneous induction repeatedly showing that it is the single focus which is leading to AF episodes uh, actually made us think that let us just do LSPV. He is already young, uh, wide uh, area of ablation in a absolutely healthy left atrium which was absolutely normal size left atrium uh, can be avoided if uh, we don't... Uh, induce AF after just an LSPV isolation. I did not see any angiogram, but uh, what was the kind of ostium? Was, was it a LSPV with a single ostium or was it two left pulmonary veins making a common as ostium? Uh, 
No, it was it was LSPV uh, osteum. I had done this case in 3D, but uh, actually uh, this was the case done uh, at the time when we had no uh, in-house 3D system. So I could not uh, get record of you know those images from the company people. It was a workshop uh, machine that was shifted to our hospital. So me me mechanistically, uh, Neeraj, one of the things that comes to my mind is, I mean, you always wonder about, yes, we know that these are great sources of uh, focal triggered art activity. And there are many times in the PVI process, you notice that the pulmonary vein sleeves can create a reasonable amount of re-entry. So, I mean, academically, when you did the mapping, did you do the 3D activation map of the vein just to see uh, where the earliest activation was, if this was truly a triggered activity that subsequently became a pulmonary vein sleeve re-entry, which is what happens. I mean, if you really look at some of the activation patterns, when, when, the, when this whole disorganized uh, activity goes away, did you see any kind of re-entry or was it uh, mostly so, a focal trigger? So yeah, so I did not uh, create activation map. Uh, 3D was used only for uh, anatomical uh, landmark. Uh, also, I thought uh, if, uh, even with the first beat of initiation, uh, if we see the atrial activity in the pulmonary vein, it was highly mm -hmm. organized. I really don't know how to map uh, this kind of activity in 3D. Uh, even if you see in this case also, uh, after in re this slide also, reinduction will lead to immediately uh, first beat is uh, focal uh, atrial premature beat, and then there will be completely disorganized atrial activity in the pulmonary vein. So I really don't know how to map this uh, activity. Uh, where were your most of the RF applications? Were they on the lower surface or was it all around or how did you do the ablation exactly? So final uh, RF ablation lesions were mainly concentrated in the ridge area. Uh, otherwise it was a smooth, uh, all ablation lesions were, uh, means electrically they were good in terms of volume. Uh, voltage reduction as well as unipolar changes. So I didn't find any much difficulty in anterior and posterior region, but uh, in the ridge area, I had a uh, issue of stability. And so at that time, uh, I had majority of my lesions were concentrated in those, uh, those regions. Do you use adenosine to confirm uh, the success? No, I did not. Right. I have a question uh, yeah. for Neera. Neera, did you check for the other veins also? Were they empty or? Yeah, no, th those all veins uh, were uh, well connected, They were, but they were non-arrhythmogenic, so I did not isolate. I tried to induce repeatedly and it was very easily inducible uh, AF. And uh, there was uh, at least five or six times we could document that it is coming from the same site. Uh, it is not coming anywhere else from, but from the left superior pulmonary. DJ, in your so side, would you agree to leave it at that or would you consider uh, isolating the other veins? DJ? DJ, no, I was you... asking Ashish uh, yeah. the same question. So, Ashish, okay. if, you were, if you were doing that case, would you have right. left the case at one target vein, especially with the patient being just 40 years old and no documented episodes of atrial fibrillation, would you have stopped at LSPV isolation alone or would you have done the other three veins knowing that the, the real long-term data is, I mean, clearly shows that the single vein is, may not be enough, right? Right. So I think in Neeraj's case speaking, particularly, he, he does show reliably that every time the onset is with the same morphology of the P wave, and he found the arrhythmogenic activity only in that particular vein. And after isolating that vein clearly and completely, he shows that he couldn't have more inducibility of the arrhythmias. So I would favor to go with Neeraj's plan that uh, isolate one vein and, and wait for uh, if there are recurrences, then do more. Uh, 
would you do it differently no i i agree with the with the way neeraj approached the case i mean especially he's young there has never been a documented episode of atrial fibrillation most of what we have seen was that one particular tachycardia then why really put him at risk for even a, the, even the slightest risk of pulmonary stenosis or longer procedure times and everything else that adds up so i i would have stopped at that aggressive induction if i didn't find anything else maybe i would keep the patient's expectations low telling them that there is a possibility that he could have atrial fibrillation down the road and maybe i would have extended this a little further by doing an implantable loop monitor uh, for long term monitoring purposes right aniraj didn't use adenosine dj would you do you routinely use adenosine uh, i mean for what its value is it kind of became part of our workflow uh, i mean yeah. i know the the, the long term data around adenosine is relatively weak but acutely at least it, it 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 makes you feel better and and i mean occasionally you will come across a scenario where uh, the veins reconnect and you go to a little bit of a touch up ablation helps you to identify a gap uh, here and there so i do yeah. i don't really use that this right thanks dj i think let's move on to the second one neeraj yes so the second case was uh, again uh, a female in 40s 43 year old female uh, hypertensive overweight in fact little bit obese uh, uh, lady who presented with history of recurrent episodes of paroxysmal palpitations she had structurally normal heart and ecg during an episode was uh, atrial fibrillation with uh, rapid ventricular rate this was uh, her ecg and she had uh, uh, similar such is three ecgs uh, with her all ecgs were suggestive of af and fast ventricular rate so uh, again as uh, drugs were not really helping her we advised rf ablation and setup was uh, for trigger mapping for paroxysmal afib we thought that uh, we are going to do all four pvs uh, most probably because we uh, could never document any psc also and this is probably the catheter induced psc during insertion of uh, decapolar cs so first as a protocol first step was uh, doing ep study and uh, uh, on incremental rv apical pacing uh, there was uh, evidence of central uh, decremental va conduction with uh, va vanky back cycle length of 300 milliseconds uh, this uh, svc is actually a decapolar catheter inside the rv because this was chosen for svc ra catheter but for ep it was placed in the right ventricle uh, on atrial program extra stimulation uh, patient baseline ah was 144 millisecond hv was 51 millisecond and there was remarkable ah jump of 99 millisecond uh, when coupling interval of atrial extra was reduced from 330 to 320 millisecond at uh, 600 millisecond drive cycle length so there was evidence of dual levy nodal uh, physiology in this case and uh, uh, with triple extra uh, uh, triple extra stimulation protocol uh, we could induce a narrow qrs tachycardia with uh, hv interval of 50 millisecond uh, there was uh, cycle length was changing from beat to beat from 400 millisecond to 360 milliseconds and there was two is to one va relationship and this was uh, this was actually un unusual for me uh, to induce uh, such tachycardia with program extra stimulation uh, earliest a was found in his bundle electrogram with septal va was uh, 24 milliseconds this uh, 2 to 1 av tachycardia continued fairly long and then it uh, spontaneously terminated with a sinus capture beat and uh, return back to sinus rhythm so repeat induction again uh, produce similar kind of 2 to 1 av uh, tachycardia uh, and uh, we just gave uh, isoprenaline uh, low dose bolus uh, and it resume uh, 2 is to 1 to 1 is to 1 va tachycardia 
So it shifted uh, to one is to one VA tachycardia with similar sequence of atrial activation. Uh, tachycycle length was uh, shortened progressively from 340 millisecond to 300 millisecond. Septal VA with one to one, there was slight septal VA change. It, uh, it prolonged to 35 millisecond with earliest A still remaining in the Hays bundle uh, electrogram. Uh, we did. Uh, uh, I could not actually pull out. Uh, I, I I remember we had done uh, his refractory PVC protocol, and uh, it did not delayed advanced uh, next his or atrial activation. Uh, what I could found was that uh, there was in uh, ventricular overdrive pacing at 270 millisecond. Uh, it actually required fourth pace bleed to uh, accelerate the atrial cycle length. And if you see uh, clearly, uh, this is sort of a premature bleed at the refractoriness of his, and there was no change in the atrial cycle length. So it was more suggestive of uh, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia rather than any, uh, any uh, though I don't have seen any nodofascicular, nodoventricular, but I think the response was uh, suggestive more of uh, AV nodal tachycardia rather than uh, nodoventricular bypass, concealed nodoventricular bypass. Right? So, uh, plan was to do uh, slow pathway ablation, and uh, this was uh, very troubling for us because as soon as we put on put the RF on, patient will again induce two to one tachycardia, which will remain. Uh, two to one for long, and then it will convert to one to one tachycardia, uh, and then it will degenerate into AFib. So this happened at least uh, three times, and every time her AFib, uh, we had to cardiovert her AFib. So probably uh, she had this. Uh, as a reason of uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation episode, uh, maybe the underlying SVT uh, was the cause. Uh, after a few of the ablation that we did, uh, and uh, living uh, frustrated actually, uh, again we induced, uh, again on ablation, again there was two to one VA tachycardia, but this time, VA interval was significantly prolonged as compared to the previous uh, RF energy. So again, uh, we did every time this tachycardia was terminated with a burst vent uh, ventricular overdrive pacing that was suggestive of that uh, it is not an automatic junctional rhythm because of the RF application, but it was the clinical tachycardia itself. So after this episode, when we saw uh, significant VA prolongation, uh, we decided to ablate it during uh, atrial pacing, which frankly I have never done. I always uh, ablate AV node, a slow pathway during uh, sinus rhythm. And here we, uh, this is the slow pathway region, and we could see very, very nice pathway, uh, probably slow pathway potential also in this region. And during atrial pacing, we did RF ablation without any, any uh, trouble, which was happening for almost one hour. So every time uh, there will be two to one tachycardia, AF will cardiovert, and then we again do it. Again, same thing used to happen. So after this uh, uh, ablation uh, during atrial pacing, uh, slow pathway was uh, there were uh, slow pathway was successfully ablated. This is during isoprenaline infusion program extra stimulation, and uh, this is AV Venky back at 250 millisecond cycle length. Uh, so patient uh, after this ablation procedure, uh, patient was discharged with aspirin, 75 milligram once a day, uh, tell me certain 40 milligram once a day. And there is no recurrence of AF or SVT in 14 months of follow-up. After ablation, we also uh, did isoprenaline, means I, we looked for isoprenaline infusion induced uh, any episodes of AF, but we could not induce any AF uh, after ablation of slow pathway. So uh, 
this was uh, actually the first uh, uh, for me uh, svt with va dissociation or v more than a relationship neurocurious tachycardia and there are various differential diagnoses avnrt with upper common pathway block which i think my case was uh, because on the various uh, uh, findings that uh, we had Junctional tachycardia with VA block was unlikely because every time it was induced with program stimulation terminated with uh, ventricular overdrive pacing. Concealed nodofascicular, nodoventricular bypass tract, uh, uh, probably uh, because his refractory PVC uh, could, did not affect atrial activation or next his activation. I don't think uh, it would be the cause in this case. Uh, another uh, cause of uh, two to uh, one VA relationship is uh, dual AV node dependent non reentrant tachycardia, which is again uh, not likely in this case because uh, this was clearly inducible with uh, program stimulation, terminated with program stimulation. So it was definitely not a non reentrant mechanism. Intrahesian reentry, again, not reported uh, yet, and even if you have you have to have some his abnormality fragmented his or something like that to do that upper septal vt again uh, was unlikely uh, in this case so uh, in summary uh, this case uh, uh, probably supports the notion that circuit of avnrt is subatrial and intranodal However, we ablated at the base of the triangle of Cox, which suggests that at least some part of the atrium is required for AVNRD. Uh, probably high density atrial mapping in such case with uh, VA block can tell us what minimum part of atria is critical for AVNRD circuit and define the level of block. We did not make any attempt to map the atria during this, uh, so we don't know. Finally, it is uh, uh, always prudent to do EP study in paroxysm, paroxysmal AFib because you know to induce AVNRT after PVI can be embarrassing and frustrating for an operator. And this lady had all her ECG of atrial fibrillation. There was not a single ECG of uh, regular narrow QRS tachycardia. So, thank you. Ashish, great case. Um, so a couple of things that I wanted to ask you. Uh, did this lady have any other risk factors like significant hypertensive heart disease or diastolic dysfunction um, or uh, anything else that would put her at risk for atrial fibrillation? Uh, she uh, she had hypertension for sure, and we prescribed uh, antihypertensive. But uh, heart was absolutely okay. There was no uh, left ventricular hypertrophy or significant atrial enlargement suggesting of diastolic dysfunction. So, uh, so there is a small series that we actually are uh, are looking at. It's 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 an interesting association. Um, a lot of people that have AV and RT with atrial fibrillation, when you take them to the lab and only arrhythmia that manifests itself is AV and RT, and, and you fix the AV and RT, the AFib goes away. And then prospectively, if you fast forward these people and, and see what happens, a significant chunk of these people actually do develop atrial fibrillation down the road. And if you really looked at the electrograms um, right at the slow pathway area, it's not oftentimes that you find an high slow pathway potential. And there are even sometimes where you see a significant amount of fractionation in the slow pathway area that is confirmed by three-dimensional electron atomic mapping that there is some amount of uh, voltage heterogeneity. And I mean, what looks like it could be a small amount of scar tissue in that area that potentially puts them at risk for re-entry. And so we went back and, and mapped some of these patients. I mean, we, we have like a limited series of uh, 18 to 20 cases that we did uh, between Andrea's lab and ours. What we found was very interesting. A lot of these people do have significant amount of left atrial uh, and right atrial scar. And so I wondered mechanistically um, 
if an underlying uh, risk factor for atrial myopathy manifests itself in some sort of a, uh, of a triggered reentry, making the slow pathway conduction even slower, putting them at higher risk for AVNRT, which in turn then sustains atrial fibrillation. And so you take out the slow pathway, you took out the immediate trigger that, that initiates atrial fibrillation. And then perhaps maybe over a period of time, the substrate continues to evolve and then they develop, they go on to develop atrial fibrillation. So beautiful case, nicely done. So Ashish, I'll give it back to you. Yeah, Neeraj, great. I mean, sometimes we should be able to go home early. Uh, but uh, what, were your, what were the medications that the patient had been given previously? And uh, strangely that uh, the AVNRT was uh, not easy to control with those medications. If you could just recap what the medications were. Yeah, so patient was given, uh, she, uh, she was given, um, I think, calcium channel blocker only. She was okay. only on. Oh, I uh, thought there was some class was, 1C drug or something. Yeah. No, anti-arrhythmics were, were given in this uh, case. Right. Uh, uh, only AV nodal uh, blockers were given. DJ, wearing away a little from the AVNRT, she is an obese lady and hypertensive. So, would you think that that puts her to uh, recurrences of AFib in uh, near future? Of course, you might not do anything at this point, just like Neeraj did. But uh, speaking about, I, I I agree. I think she would be relatively high risk for future occurrence of atrial fibrillation. So. I would definitely keep her on the radar uh, so that she doesn't fall through the crack. This is somebody that I think needs long-term follow-up. I mean, I would even consider an annual um, follow-up. Uh, again, I mean, I mean, I know the ILR is issue in India, I mean, is always fraught with its own challenges, but this is somebody that I would definitely put an ILR in uh, because I would say almost all of these guys come back with uh, AFIP in the future. Right. Uh, I think there's a request for you, DJ, to speak about the prayer study. Would you want to do it now and before we go to the before we go to the ice, uh, device cases? Whichever way. I mean, if you want me to do it now, I can do it now. Or if you want to wait until the end, that's totally fine too. Sure. So I think do it now and we'll go ahead with the device cases. That right. would be a different subject. Would you want to take the questions which are on the chat? Prior to yes. DJ going in for the prayer study. Let's do that. Yeah, let's do the questions and then we can get to the... There are questions on the chat, actually. Yeah, yeah sure. I'll go through them. Uh, how, how many months since this case has been done uh, that you have not been able to document a recurrence? 20 months. So more than one and a half year. Right. Uh, same thing what DJ advised in the last case as to uh, doing an ILR for this uh, lady. I mean, I guess there'll be a big difference in opinion in DJ's and your approach, Neeraj. So, but just to give a spare a thought, uh, would you, yeah. so I, which I way agree. would you monitor such a patient or would it depend on the symptoms alone? Yeah, so I agree this uh, last case, uh, she is uh, an obese female. Uh, hypertensive, so she is anyway at high risk of uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, the fact that right now, uh, after procedure, she is asymptomatic. Uh, I am, right now I'm convinced that, okay, my ablation has helped her, but uh, she can develop AFib for sure in future. And uh, we usually don't follow up them unless they come back with the symptoms. So usually they go back, uh, they come on. <laughs> Once right. ablation is done. Right. Sure. So she is not in a study situation. So I guess uh, that's what No, she is. But yeah, but right. she, is, uh, she is coming for hypertensive because she has hypertension. Right, right, right. So what rate, what rate did you pace the atrium while you finally could ablate uh, without getting into AFib? Uh, uh, what was the pacing rate? What was the atrial pacing rate? So atrial burst pacing, sir, uh, as a protocol, we once EP study is done, we in all patient, it, we started from 250 to we go up to 180. 
so it is very fast. So while you are ablating, what rate, what atrial pacing rate? For, uh, yeah, so 400 milliseconds. Okay. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there's another question here which asks you uh, how quickly uh, when you initiated the energy were you landing in AFib, making it difficult to continue? How quickly? How quickly did your uh, sinus rhythm degenerate into AF when you switched? Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. As soon as you put the pedal uh, switch on RF, patient will uh, I'll just uh, go back. So as soon as you put the switch uh, RF on, patient will develop 2 to 1 tachycardia first. That will convert to 1 to 1 and then it will degenerate into AF. Does anybody uh, uh, propound uh, ablating uh, for AVNRT in I? We most of us do it in sinus rhythm. Is anybody in favor of uh, doing the ablation during AVNRT or during AFib? DJ, any take on that? I mean, as as you are aware of the, um, I mean, the pitfalls of of pacing and how rapidly your uh, your AV node can disappear in front of your eyes. I mean, there are, there are, I think, vast majority of the cases, I would like to do it in sinus. Um, That's right. In an yeah. occasional scenario, when you have a lot of ectopy while you're ablating the slow pathway that is impacting your ability to, to decipher the electrograms and yet successfully deliver the RF energy, those are the cases where I would probably pace from the uh, atrium and then kind of stabilize the rhythm a little bit to be able to deliver the lesion properly. But in, in vast majority of cases, I probably would ablate it in sinus. Right. Uh, one last question before we let Neeraj go in the interest of time. Uh, Neeraj, what was your strategy with the oral anticoagulants? She is what Charles Vask, uh, two, three. So, in, uh, Actually, I have not given oral anticoagulation in both patients. Uh, first case I gave because I ablated in the left atrium, I gave it for three months. Uh, I feel that in first case, it is AF was purely an electrical problem in his case. And uh, that, way, that is why I didn't consider oral anticoagulation. There was no risk factor, 40 year old male. So I just gave oral anticoagulation because uh, I ablated inside the left atrium. Uh, in second case, I didn't even, uh, I just discharged her on aspirin because uh, it, was, uh, it was essentially a slow path for ablation only. Right. Thanks Neeraj for presenting both the cases. Uh, very interesting. In interest of the time, BJ, I think let's move on. And while Amaya puts up his slides and shares screen, uh, DJ, uh, can you uh, can you respond to the that uh, question sure. of presenting the prayer? Yeah. So the, the 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 prayer study, I mean, comes from this whole idea of uh, can a divine intervention help recovery of a patient? Right. I mean, I think science and spirituality kind of they are. I mean, there is a thin line of separation at at some point, and as Somebody famous said where science is where spirituality starts. And this is an idea that I have toyed with for a long time. When I was a resident in medicine in 1999, we did a, uh, uh, the Mid-America Heart Institute CCU prayer study back in 1999. It was kind of a, uh, I mean, it, it, there were positive trends, but it was never really a true positive study coming with obvious limitations of looked at only CCU patients. We looked at, uh, it was really not a universal global deal. So Corona presented itself in a, a very unique opportunity to really test that particular hypothesis. Uh, if you were to do a, a global multi-denominational double-blinded study, um, uh, crossing across the nations, religions, languages, color and race, would you have a, an impact on, on outcomes? I mean, I mean, many people thought I was borderline crazy and some people thought I was kind of a study. But 
uh, but I think it's needed to be studied. And that's kind of the reason why uh, we did a, a multinational, multi-denominational steering committee and people who had real interest in this particular subject. Um, I think the, the questions, I, I think the reason why this study is different is number one, it's a global study. We are trying to tackle a, a pandemic that doesn't really have any meaningful uh, therapeutic uh, options at this point in time. Uh, any result is better than no result. Um, it's, and then uh, we double-blinded the study. So this, this so-called uh, confounding factor of patients knowing about it or uh, others knowing about it causing some kind of a placebo effect is, is completely removed. And it's relatively easy to do because you can actually enroll your patients online. So that's the summary of the study. So uh, all of you and any of you that would love to, uh, that like to participate in the study, would love to have you guys on board. So any questions? Thanks, DJ. I think that's really our thinking out of the box. And uh, we would uh, probably look to the results and uh, probably also to participate in first place. Thanks. Yeah, just one question. Is there an IRB issue involved? Do we need to get clearance or? It, it is usually uh, IRB exempt, but you have to still run it by them because you, you double blind them and none of the patient's uh, actual identifiable data gets anywhere other than you. So uh, it's usually IRB exempt, but you have to get a clearance from your local IRB. Okay. Thanks, um, uh, I, at our institution, they said, uh, I'm Jayshri here, uh, that it would be an expedited and it would take maybe two weeks or more. So when are the actual, uh, the prayers starting? We, the study starts today and each patient gets their, their prayer whenever they get enrolled. So it doesn't matter whether you enroll them today or two weeks. So, so please stay on it and uh, join us. Okay. Uh, let's move on. I think we have good time left for Dr. Amey Udyavar from Mumbai to present his uh, four device cases. Amey, over to you. Hi, good evening everyone. I think I'm audible to everyone. Sure. Yeah, so last few days uh, we have been talking about a lot of EP. So I thought uh, this time let us prepare a small uh, symposium on a device tracings. These are some tracings which I found interesting, simple but interesting in my last two, three years. So I'll just, this is the first case, a 66 year old male patient, diabetic, hypertensive, has a tachybrady syndrome and had come to me with a history of synco. He underwent a dual chamber pacemaker, this was in 2014, a Senjud medical ascent DR was implanted, comparatively asymptomatic, doing well. However, as he had a tachybrady, he has had 17 episodes of mode switch. This was when we found on interrogation. So if you see here, you have auto mode switch, 17 episodes. And you also see high ventricular rate episodes. There are five episodes which have been recorded with a rate of 175 beats per minute. Now this is, you see the timing is here. So it's on November, July, 2014 and so forth. So one of these ventricular high rate episodes, I just thought that I will go into the intracardiac EGM. And if you see the electrocardiograms, you will notice that these are recorded as high ventricular rate episodes. But if you see, there is always an A which is preceding the V. And not only that, sometimes the number of A's are more than V's. So this is definitely not a ventricular tachycardia, including the RR is a little irregular. And so this is definitely an atrial fibrillation which is going on with a fast ventricular rate. Now the device has recorded this as a ventricular high rate episode. So if you see the annotation, the first channel is the atrial EGM, the second channel is a ventricular EGM, and the third channel are the annotations which are done by the pacemaker. In the lower half of the trace, you will see that you have all these V sensors which have been recorded. So the upper half is the atrial tracing and the lower one, the red box you see is the ventricular V sense. However, you will see most of the A sense has not been annotated at all. There have been three A senses which have recorded and there is an AR. AR is that means that's a refractory. It's falling in the ventricular refractory period. So that is what it has recorded. So my concern was though you have so many A's here, why does the device fail to recognize these A's? So that was my concern and I thought of troubleshooting this, why this was happening. 
and if you see one of the findings would be reasons would be one is that the a are very low in amplitude because there is atrial fibrillation going on and that's why probably it's not being getting detected so if you see if the a is not being sensed this is one of the automode switch you see there's a atrial egm which is very small so this is almost like 1 mm and uh, it's almost like 1 mm and still the device annotates as a, a sense so definitely there is not a issue because most of the egms we are bigger than this in amplitude so what is it so one is that it falls in the refractory period that is the pvarp pvvar but however if it would have fallen in the pvar it would have still detected as a ar or annotated as ar uh, atrial refractory so the only thing which is possible that it is falling in the a pvab that is post ventricular atrial blanking period pvab so this is immediately following the ventricular sense or ventricular pace that is what i guess must have been happening so when you go back and you see each ventricular egm the atrial egm is immediately following the ventricular egm almost like 90 to 110 milliseconds or 140 milliseconds it's nothing more than that and the moment it goes more than 200 milliseconds or 250 milliseconds it comes in the atrial sense of the ar however most of these egms atrial egms are following immediately after the atrium the preceding ventricle and that's why these are the egms which is the device is not able to recognize because it's all falling in the blanking period as we all know anything which falls in the blanking period is not annotated is not sensed by the device so all these egms were falling in the pvab not only that unlike icd most of these devices will not have tem svt vt discriminators so there is no way by which this devices will recognize that and this as which were falling in this pvab were labeled as uh, ventricular tachycardia or vt so what we did was the default value of the pvab was 130 milliseconds and i reduced it to 90 this is a fixed value in all pacemakers pvab is not auto most of the new pacemakers the pvarp is a auto sensitivity driven or driven by the heart rate but the pvab is fixed one can still reduce it but there is a limit to which you can reduce because if you reduce it too much it is going to detect the ventricular sense or the ventricular pace and this is going to cause an double counting by the device and that's why there is a limit to which by which you can reduce the pvab in my case i reduced it to 90 from 130 and this would definitely reduce all our episodes and further interrogation showed that there was no episodes detected so here as i said there's inverse relation between the duration of the pvab and the detection of atrial arrhythmias in our case shortening of the pvab allowed us to trouble us with the problem one can also notice that in the case of atrial flutter if you have a twist to one most of the p waves every alternate p wave will fall inside the pvab and that's why a lot of atrial flutter algorithms are there which is called as twist to one search or atrial flutter search algorithm where the pacemaker itself increases the pvab or the p warp so that it detects the p wave especially in flutter because if flutter what will happen every p wave alternate p wave will be falling inside the qrs or in the pvab and that's why you have this flutter algorithms which is there are different flutter algorithms in this particular pacemaker this is a older model and that's why we didn't have this model uh, flutter algorithm otherwise there was a chance that it would have detected or picked it up so in this case i thought it was interesting because i have seen almost three patients with af detecting as fast ventricular rate and unlike icd most of these pacemakers are just not able to trouble shoot or you know label them properly and it always mentions this ventricular high rate episode i think when you see a pacemaker patient we would still be concerned why there's a ventricular high rate episodes and that's why i included this case in this discussion oh yeah if you keep this slide just before yes. we go to the next case i think uh, of course uh, uh, these de pacemaker devices don't have the icd algorithm yeah. but uh, in icds there is abbot has this uh, chamber of onset uh, Uh, algorithm where yes. that helps it to classify uh, so icd wouldn't have made this mistake because clearly you have a uh, chamber of onset as atrium uh, yes. that's a one quick comment uh, dhananjay would you want to say anything dj would you want to give a comment on this i think yeah yeah i think yeah, yeah. i think uh, your, your your comments were right on the money and obviously 
these are the limitations of uh, uh, pacemakers uh, that perhaps run on some of the older platforms of, uh, of, of, of software and, and, and hardware. So I think this is a feature that if there are improvements in, in the pacemaker technology that needs to happen, I think this is something that has to happen. And I don't think device companies have spent enough money to uh, change out the circuit boards uh, in, a, in, in a long time. So uh, I think it be, it's, it's again, uh, all the bells and whistles and then and what's the cost of doing these things, right? It's not like it's, it's an impossible technology, but it has to be done. Sure. Amir, you can but, yeah. The yeah, because what interested me was that you see in this lower tracing, almost there are four to five consecutive A's and nothing has been picked up. And that is what interested me and that's why I tried to go into the detail. Now coming to the second case, again, this is a elderly gentleman and also a lady. She implant, uh, was with, implanted with the pacemaker in 2012 in the US. Her husband was a physician and she has been doing pretty well since 2012. However, since the October of last year, she has had multiple episodes of loss of consciousness. So she always thought that this is probably a vasovagal. She said, whenever I walked, suddenly I used to feel giddy. I used to fall down. And she remembers one episode when she came here to visit India for, with her relatives, she came out of the lift and she almost was unconscious for four to five minutes. That is what the relatives say. I know her doctor, uh, husband is a physician. He was not there at that time, but they say that definitely the relatives did some sort of CPR on her. Now on interrogation, there is a multiple mode switch episodes of AF which were seen. And when I was called in, she was already admitted with the cardiologist. And the interrogation showed me that... Uh, the cardiologist told me Uska battery, you know, has already reached DRI. And uh, if you see here, 22nd Jan 2020, approximately time to implant is less than three months. And he said, you know, we need to change the battery. And that's the thing. Uh, however, I was not happy with this report because she has had four to five episodes of syncope and she also gave a history of uh, this thing. And if you see the 21st Jan 2020, there is an episode of uh, query ventricular tachycardia. Now, parameter-wise, the P wave was sensed very nicely. The intrinsic amplitude is mentioned as 16, but she was almost paced 100% of the time. Thresholds, if you see the P wave amplitude, though it is very, has been quite good, more than two or three. Impedance also is good. You should see the ventricular impedance because we wanted to rule out a lead fracture. So here you see the ventricular impedance, though it, it seems to be coming down from the 500 to this 400 range gradually. But however, there's not a, like sudden cutoff, which you see here, like R wave amplitude. Of course, there's not much of R wave you can sense. Probably it has detected something, but then she was 100% dependent. So I don't give a lot of importance to this tracing. And when I see the counter, you see ventricular episodes, okay? So you see almost since the October, she has had 4,800 episodes of non-sustained VT and 6,000 since the last reset, since the last 80 to 6,000 episodes. And my concern was whether there was any change in the lead impedance. So both leads were normal. There was no noise in the ventricular EGM. Even on interrogation with the arm movement, there was no noise. So there was nothing to suggest that there was a lead fracture. So auto threshold was on in her that mentioned as a threshold of 1.7. But when we checked it, the threshold, it was capturing nicely at one volt. Lead impedances, both leads were normal. There was no noise at all on the RV channel. So both the channels, atrial and ventricle, seems to be functioning well. There was normal impedance. X-rays, which were done, a fluoroscopy was done, did not show any lead fracture, any break in insulation. ECG was bang normal. There were no VPCs, however. Okay. So and normal EF. So my thought was, what is this? Is it a lead issue? Is it a battery issue? Is it a so what would you do? Replace a generator, replace the RV lead, or implant the ICD because of so many VT episodes? So because that is definitely 6,000 VT episodes, right? And here, if you see the mass, this is on the day when I checked her. This is on 21st Jan. You see a lot of VT episodes, however, varying rate. So this device doesn't allow you to uh, retrieve the EGMs? 
actually when i saw her the device had an already been interrogated and because it is interrogated the past data was wiped off so when i was called in on 21st so i had only one day data with me the previous session you know if you see here previous session i had this 31st october and after that it was rechecked by the cardiologist just a day before and then uh, when i was called in fact the whole data had been wiped off so i didn't have any good egms as such but fortunately i could retrieve one egm but what struck me was this because you see this is a six in the last 82 days she has had almost 2 lakh 2 lakh ventricular ectopics total pvcs so this was something very unusual so i was thinking whether it's a cardiomyopathy whether it's a vt she has a history of cpr so it's a whether it's a non sustained vt so i thought let us see the ventricular egms fortunately i got this episode on the 21st which she had three four episodes now you see there is no atrial uh, recording for some reason but ventricular definitely one can see that there is some noise okay it's not a continuous noise it is intermittent noise and it is picked up as ventricular tachycardia so you see there is a ventricular tachycardia here ecg bang normal so again here you see vt 723 3205 228 so varying noise on the ventricular region now this was being captured as vt episodes and vpcs and definitely it was something to do with the lead fracture and if you see normally a lead fracture will cause a very high frequency saturated egm in this case the egms were clean however only the noise was intermittent because of probably some disruption occurring only intermittently otherwise normally we call them filers and as you know there are a lot of definitions of noise and noise has been classified sub classified into different types so in this case there was definitely something to do with not the generator but the lead and that's why i changed the lead and put a new lead in and again so, another case of ventricular high rate episode rather which i thought was more because of the ventricular lead fracture so i may a couple of things is yes it is well known that these kind of uh, lead problems if the conductor fracture is not that it's only a insulation break then many times you can't elicit that with your maneuvers to show that the lead is a problem up front uh, yeah. so what were your findings uh, during the implant reimplant procedure and secondly why so during the implant the lead impedance was okay it was slightly lower range around 400 but there was no change in the ventricular region so i thought i think that the disconnection was not every time it may be in a particular position or a particular movement must be happening and that time the lead must be getting you know disconnected but otherwise most of the time i had nothing means the lead parameters were okay the threshold was okay so there was nothing to suggest a lead fracture per se but this ventricular rate high rate episodes and we she had done a holter episode she had done a long term monitor even on the 21st when she was observed in the hospital though it mentions as vt episodes the 24 hour the monitor of the hospital didn't show any vt episodes. right and uh, what was the explanation for the syncope then in your mind i thought this was lead malfunction so i was very convinced that this was lead malfunction because her lvf was normal she never complained of palpitation she said i was always okay i just suddenly used to fall down so she had never history of and because her doctor husband was a physician they had done three four holter test including a long term holter of 7 10 days that also failed to pick up any vpc not even a single vpc and no ventricular tachycardia as well when the pacemaker showed that almost there were some 7 lakh ectopics so i would have expected some ectopic you know, if you had a whole pacemaker which shows 7 lakh ectopics since october i would have expected some ectopics at least on the holter right for 17 days right fortunately this was done jan she is back in us side she is doing well <laughs> right so this was one case dj something from your side some comments no i mean i think uh, i mean you guys touched on all the important points there's sure. really not more on then sure so again a young girl 20 year old underwent pacemaker for multiple episodes of syncope now she was very young she had complete heart block 2013 and it was acute onset so i was suspecting some cardiomyopathy she was extensively worked with with a pet and all those things but uh, nothing suggested any inflammatory disorder echo was normal and finally after almost a 
ten days of observation, the rate just wouldn't pick up, and we had to implant a dual chamber pacemaker. So it was implanted. Regular follow up every year she is undergoing, and when she came back to me, ventricular pacing was almost sixty percent of the time. Her main complaint was that she was very symptomatic, very symptomatic because of severe palpitations which occurred on exam. And this was very disturbing to her because she used to go to dance class and go to college and all. And she said that I get very breathless and palpitations. I'm uncomfortable when I get these palpitations. And again here. Once I interrogated the device, you see that is almost mode switch. One eighty-one times there are episodes of mode switch. Though it is a very small percentage, point two percent, but mode switch is one eighty-one. This is a Medtronic adapter device. High atrial rate episodes one sixty-five, and mode switch, which is lasting more than sixty seconds, thirty seconds, is one eighty-one episodes. Again, here too, one will find there is a high ventricular rate episodes one seventy one. 70 high ventricular rate episodes again i was surprised that why these ventricular high rate episodes is it some tachycardia going on some svt or is this some cardiomyopathy atrial tachy giving rise to some cardiomyopathy so i started her on beta blocker because the device would not show any uh, so anything else so she was started on a beta blocker sent home but after few days again she came back saying that no i am very symptomatic and i get very breathless so again the device was interrogated this is something in 2016 and here if you see the ventricular and the atrial egm i don't there is no egm here in this particular thing and there is no egm at all which i could get but i could get the annotated thing so here you have a a sense b sense a sense b sense a sense b sense and if you see the throughout the tracing you have a a sense and a b sense which is occurring together At the rate of almost 320 beats per minute, so this is A sense, B sense, almost occurring together. Like so, the first thing when you see A sense, B sense together, it is whether it is a AV NRT which is occurring. So that was one DD for me, or whether it yeah. is some atrial tachycardia which is occurring. So I was not able to. So we did the interrogation through the device. Where you know you can pace through the device, you can do a EP study through the device, which was also done. There was no tachycardia induced. So again, she was put on beta blocker, sent home. Again, she came back to me. I started on an Eva Bradin. After few months, again she comes back saying, "No, this is very uh, symptomatic. I can't tolerate this. Do something." So then finally, I said, "Let's do a EP study." So in the EP study, you have a A, A H V, and that's the ventricular device here and uh, this is the paced so when you pace here this is the ventricular pacing when you pace ventricular there is no va actually the va is completely dissociated here there is no va the va dissociated so definitely this rules out uh, avrt pathways even to some extent avrt so again we gave her isoprenal and uh, no tachycardia could be induced finally isoprenaline was given this was induced Can you see? What do you think it is? So if you see, there is no clear P wave seen here. The ECG looks like a classical AV NRT. And here, if you see the P wave, the ablation is in the HRA. So ablation distal and proximal is in the HRA. There is a His catheter. There is a CS. There is a RV. You see the A and the V are almost simultaneous. But in the baseline EP study, I didn't find any AH jump. There was no AH jump. The VA was dissociated. Even with isoprenaline, there was no VA conduction. So, I mean, this was induced by program stimulation or just with isoprenaline? Isoprenaline. No program stimulation. No program stimulation. This was just with isoprenaline. Yeah. So this was nothing but. sinus tachycardia so as the rate slows down you see she is conducting with a sinus tachy with a prolonged pr and the next qr is is falling on the next p wave that was what is happening she was getting into a first degree av block with high rates whenever she used to exercise dance walk she used to go and conduct because the av search was on because of she was only 60% paced because of the av search being on she used to have a native conduction with a very prolonged pr of almost 300 400 milliseconds and this used to cause some probably a diastolic mr which used to cause her to have symptoms and this was what was observed so this is a sinus tachy with a prolonged pr and as you reduce the rate as the isoprenaline washout phase you can clearly see here the p wave the sinus tachy slows down 
with a prolonged PR of 450 milliseconds or 430 milliseconds. So this was nothing but a sinus tachycardia with a prolonged PR. Now again, quite uncommon to see in lot of patients, but probably because she was a young lady, she was recovering in her AV node conduction and intermittently when she was, especially during exercise, she used to conduct. So what I did was I deactivated the AV search because this was causing her palpitations. She was very uncomfortable. So I didn't do any AV search. AV search was put off. The high rate was increased to 180 because she, her native exercise rate used to go almost atrial rate go to 180. And I also reduced the sinus rate by giving a very high dose of beta blocker in your brain. After that, in fact, she has been thankful to me saying that, you know, sir, aapne bhot achcha kiya. Like, no, I have no palpitations, very happy. So I again, uh, case of, uh, and I published this with Saurabh in the heart rhythm case reports. This was just published last, the last month, February 2020. So, Great, so uh, what was the probable cause of her uh, heart block, uh, paroxysmal complete heart block, right? So other times? Actually, I, we, I could not think, I mean, she was extensively worked up because of her young age. We were worked up for ACE levels, sarcoidosis, cardiac pet. So all these things was done, nothing came positive. In fact, I waited for her almost two weeks because earlier when she presented to me, she was only venke backing. She never had complete heart block. So in fact, I told her that you can go home, put a loop recorder. She was sent home and she had a fall while driving a scooter, one of her in the past history. So then I said that you can't be left alone. So after, because that could be you know, life threatening, especially when you're driving a scooter and you have a fall syncope. So after that, we put a pacemaker. It's so almost extensively worked up. She was done for a seven day loop recorder, uh, sarcoid. So cardiac enzymes, nothing came positive. Even the eco, everything was normal. I don't know whether I missed when you have such a long PR uh, yes. happening, you presume there is a slow pathway. So after isoprenaline, on isoprenaline, did you do a EP study again? Did you? Yes, yes, yes. I did. Because one DD and was that whether this was a AVNRT. So AVNRT or atrial tachycardia, which is conducting with a prolonged PR. So I didn't, I actually deleted a lot of slides because I was told to reduce the. Right. So after that, I wanted because this was just a tachycardia with a simultaneous A and V. So it could be any tachycardia with a simultaneous A and V. Atrial tachycardia, AVNRT, a, uh, sinus tachy, any of these. So the maneuvers were done and I didn't find anything. And the VA was still dissociated during the tachycardia. Interesting, Amaya. Before so, you move on to the fourth case, just some comments from uh, DJ about uh, how to deal with these atrial high rate episodes uh, uh, in general. Uh, how to go about them, a uh, few important issues. No, I think um, I think most of what was said was, was great. And the, the issue that I find in some of these cases is as much as you want to minimize ventricular pacing, in, in some of these patients, we may not have <clears throat> many options in these cases that allow them to pace. Uh, to get them off of this, this whole uh, symptomatic um, diastolic mitral regurgitation that happens with the with these super extended PR intervals. Then the question remains, should we be aggressively looking for uh, long-term pacing induced cardiomyopathy in these patients? I mean, especially somebody young like her, you really don't want to kind of um, get them and fall through the cracks. So I think having an appropriate follow-up for these patients is, is super critical. Maybe enrolling these patients into uh, remote monitoring uh, would be a good idea. So I hope she's on remote monitoring. Uh, okay. She's regularly following up with me, but then she is not on a remote monitor because in, in our uh, country, most of the patients don't get a remote monitor device. However, regularly every year she follows up and uh, she's doing quite good. I think what I must have missed was that when I dug deeper and she gave that all these palpitations were on exertion. So that was one history which I thought I must have overlooked in my initial follow-up with her. But after the sinus tachycardia with a prolonged PR, then I started inquiring when do these episodes occur? And she was very specific that they occur when I climb the bridge, when I go to a dance class, when I do some activity. Like So I think that also gave me some clues that this was definitely a sinus tachy with a prolonged PR, which was bothering her. Like so all these three cases, 
they were all presenting with ventricular high rate episodes so as we all know ventricular high rate episodes can be because of true vt or maybe svt or maybe noise so i thought this was a good collection because the first case showed af second was a lead fracture with vpcs and the third was a the fourth one is the icd case ischemic cardiomyopathy ef is 25% he has had episodes of vt in the past icd was implanted single chamber fortified device was implanted four years back kims now he settled here in mumbai comes to me for follow up so when he came to me for follow up his device was interrogated now you see the first two leads are ecg leads 2 and 3 the third one is the leadless ecg okay and the fourth one is ventricular bipolar now this is a single chamber device so you have a ventricular eg which is regularly following here and you see something which is not following with the qrs okay it is in between the qrss but this is seen only on the leadless ecg it is not there in the 12 led ecg is a body surface ecgs it is not there in the ventricular bipolar it is there only in the leadless ecg so there was definitely something which was going at the rate of 60 beats per minute so this was a regular signal which was coming at the 60 beats per minute only in the leadless ecg no relation with petrol patient's atrial and ventricular activity and subsequently i found this in another three patients when i recorded with, with for them follow up and this was with the same device now here this is the another patient you see this is a ventricular egm and you see again the same similar complex which is occurring at 1000 milliseconds cycle length okay but again only seen in the ventricular leadless ecg this is during a vt episode so here again you see a vt which is occurring fast in fact the ventricular egm in the leadless ecg is very small but you see this is signal again which is at the rate of 1000 beats per minute again at sorry 60 beats per minute at 1000 so this was seen only in the leadless ecg now we all know leadless ecgs are nothing but sensing signals between the svc coil and the can now this patient did not have a svc coil okay so there is no bipoles bipolar sensing occurring so definitely it is almost like a inactive pole one of the pole is inactive because there is no svc coil and the other thing which is going to sense is only from the can so it is sensing something from the can with the ventricular thing is not seen so this is the signal which you see and when i change the configuration to rv coil to the can the signals disappear okay so this is definitely some signal which was coming from the can in fact i asked the company fellow what is this they could not answer i think we discussed it in the ihrs group also uh, and we were still confused so finally none of them could answer and i sent a query to senjur medical europe team and they said that this is nothing but something called as field effect transistor signals the field effect transistor is by definition as you see in by asirvakan it's a type of transistors which is used for high voltage switching so as you all know icd delivers a small direct current which is converted into alternating current and when it is charging it converts into a larger alternating current now this there is a switch between the battery and the transformer to convert this dc into ac now this switching is done by this transistor tra uh, something called fet and this is the transistor which is refreshed every second and this is the so this was answered by a senjur medical engineer from switzerland so it's a la lady who told me that this is what you are seeing and that's why the only way you can troubleshoot is from the rv coil to can all these devices come with a default configuration for leadless ecg of the svc coil to the can but now because most of these devices don't have a svc coil they have not made that change now now i think they have made that change but in the older time at 3 to 3 years back there was no change in this so this was nothing but so as you so leadless ecg is not used for interpretation so you can easily change this so what we troubleshooted was we changed this configuration from rv coil to can and we got rid of the signals again this also got published in heart rhythm case reports this is a old case almost 2018 <laughs> so again the interesting case which i found was good so i presented here so i think that's the last right good insights uh, amir yeah d something to comment no oh, very very nice case and uh, so the 
the the signal that happens there I'm a little bit confused on this whole FET effect, right? So right. why is that more pronounced when you don't have an SVC coil? Yeah, so what the- It's absent when you actually connect it to the RV coil? Yeah, so when you have a SVC coil, so it's like a bipolar sensing. So when you have a SVC coil and uh, uh, there is no SVC coil, so it's almost like a unipolar sensing. So it's the only the can which is sensing. But you have, when you have two sensors, you have a RV coil and a can, you have one maybe positive wave in the can and the negative wave in the coil and they cancel each other. And because it gets canceled because of bipolar, you know, bipolar is the cancellation of the two unipolar signals. And that's why you don't see the signal. But once you remove this one of these unipolar sensors, you have only a unipolar sensor where you have only a, maybe a positive wave or negative wave, which is being picked up. So what was that artifact actually? What is it called? It is called protection field effect transistor signals. <laughs> Very technical. Even I was yeah, not yeah. able to answer this. That's why I took the help of the Senjud engineers. And uh, fortunately, that lady answered it. So I was very glad and that you, we could make out what it was like. And you told me before I would have arranged for a third moderator who... <laughs> 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 but very nice cases. Uh, this, this is definitely something I've never seen or, or read about. So uh, I learned a couple of things today. Right. Yes. Thanks a lot. Uh, Thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to present these cases. Like, because I thought the last two weeks right. we have a lot of EPCA stuff. So I thought that these few things I observed quite interesting in the last two, three years. So I said I'll just compile them and present it on devices. Thank you. Dhananjay, do you have uh, integrated by, uh, integrated ICD leads in uh, uh, use? I mean, Boston has only them. So do you, uh, can you uh, remember some artifacts or some uh, some issues that are related to this uh, not true bipolar, but the integrated ICD lead? I mean, we, we have historically not done as many, as many Boston cases um, or biotronic cases um, so most I think so our local hospitals here have a preferential contract with um, um, with St. Jude and Medtronic so the bulk of the devices that we, we have dealt with are these two companies um, so I, I really can't help any of my personal experiences with the integrated uh, ICD leads maybe somebody else in the group has I think Dr. Saxena allows uh, devices. So yeah, so yeah, we have we have implanted, but uh, I don't remember too many problems. So in in couple of patients, we felt there was some uh, atrial oversensing, occasional atrial oversensing, because in a smaller individual, this uh, RV coil may sometimes hang into the into the RA, and that may sometimes cause uh, this thing. Otherwise, uh, it's not really a problem. Right. Um, because if, in most cases the the coil will be in, in the vent right. so this much problem but bipolar def, something that i definitely prefer because that gives us more options also supposing somebody has t wave over sensing you can change the vector so it's definitely better to have a true bipolar but uh, not much problem with integrated yeah. bipolar Dr. Saxena, with uh, with the t wave over sensing obviously you have uh, algorithms but if you with this integrated lead you get a p wave over sensing yes then that is a significant concern i think because you yeah, then you are in, uh, exactly silly. definitely significant concern you try to yeah. in, decrease the p wave the you try to decrease the sensitivity that you compromise That's the, the you can only sensing. decrease the sensitivity yeah you have to and only decrease you will the probably exactly. have to put another Definitely. that's a problem if uh, it happens right right sure and then you have no option uh, but to change the lead to a true bipolar right 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 sure so i think we have had uh, most of it uh, uh, it's time to uh, i think uh, wind up this session it was good that amaya introduced some device cases and took us out of the usual rat of uh, and uh, i observed we, this uh, high ventricular rate episodes i think at least yeah. patients where the device is just not able to interpret and probably because they don't have the sophisticated algorithms which icd we have that is one collection of this. that's true and i think we so, have good uh, this is
from Neeraj. Yeah, Vanita, last word to you. Uh, I think you are the moderators. You know, you have to take it forward. It was an excellent uh, session, of course. Dr. DJ, please, last words from you. Oh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to be on. And I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, the HRS, IHRS effort is really, I mean, doing amazing things. And uh, I, 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 a lot of times I don't respond on things because there, there are beautiful discussions on the, on the website. So one other thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, this week, uh, I know uh, that two of the members of IHRS uh, are, are being recognized by HRS, Dr. Saxena, and then uh, Sri Sundaram also got the Global Humanitarian Award. Uh, what do you guys think of doing a happy hour uh, on the next Saturday or Sunday, whichever work for you? Maybe we do a, something similar to what we did here, um, like a Zoom recognition, IHRS recognition for both uh, Saxena and Sundaram. Um, we do a happy hour, virtual happy hour. Would, would that be? Oh, that would be great. That would oh, be great. Certainly, certainly. That would be great. Yeah. So maybe we'll coordinate between uh, the IHRS uh, executive team and us. We will coordinate the timing sure. and, and, and the details. Sure. So stay in sure. touch with you. That'll be great. That'll be great. So uh, I just sure, want to add one more. Uh, I just wanted everybody's opinion. Uh, Dr. Saxena, you must have heard that the lockdown has been extended for another two weeks. So it is not ending on the 4th. Yes. And we were planning to do yeah. this once a week uh, rather than twice a week because of the lockdown being open. So should we for the next at least two weeks continue as twice a week? I need everybody. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it should not be a problem. Okay. I think uh, we And in addition to the uh, coming uh, uh, Tuesday, we will do Tuesday and Friday. We will do the the session which uh, happy hour session which PJ has just suggested on Saturday. Great. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Thank you, DJ. Thank you everyone for being here. And uh, no, so you. I didn't get you. So what's the what's the final thing? Are we doing Tuesday or not? Yes, we are. We will do Tuesday. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Great. everybody. Bye. DJ Ameya. Wonderful. Thanks. Neeraj. Bye bye. Thanks, DJ. Thanks, Thanks for See everybody in the. Thanks, DJ. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye, DJ.